So we are almost a week into the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, but it's impossible not to continue to regret the loss of life that was occasioned by the fighting on both sides of the conflict. But thankfully, the Israel Defense Forces countered the extraordinary threat of more than 4,000 rockets and greatly damaged Hamas's capability for some time to come. But some of the damage that occurred cannot be dealt with by a ceasefire. We're seeing the fallout both in Israel, Israeli society with its Arab minority and around the world as support for the Palestinian cause quickly turned into hatred of Israel and then hatred of Jews and now violence against Jews. Like most of what happens these days in our world, this plays out and is amplified online, especially on social media. We have all seen our feeds filled with vicious anti-Israel rhetoric and images, and of course, anti-Semitism. Now, ADL is no stranger to hate and anti-Semitism on social media. We have been countering it for years. Indeed, in the wake of the racial justice movement just last summer, we partnered with the NAACP, Color of Change, the Latinx organization, LULAC, and others to demand that Facebook and Instagram seriously address the vitriolic hate found on their platforms. Once we got the backing of 1,200 top companies to pull their ads for one month, they began listening. And we saw many changes through the fall, including removal of Holocaust denial postings from the platforms. At the center of these efforts fighting online hate is Dave Sifri, my partner and the director of ADL's, uh, the vice president and director of ADL's Center for Technology and Society. I'm so pleased that he'll be speaking on today's panel about steps you can take to control anti-Semitism on social media. But managing anti-Semitism anti is not just a technological issue. It is also a substantive one. And we have asked one of the leading experts on Israel and anti-Semitism, Dr. Rachel Fish, to join us today to frame all of this for us and to offer us the language to use. Now, my friendly advice to all of you is to take very good notes. We are all depending on those listening to be our ambassadors on this National Day of Action Against Anti-Semitism. ADL and any of the organizations involved in this cannot do this work alone. So once again, so glad you were here. And now I am very pleased to introduce the moderator of today's important discussion, Scott Richman. He is the director of ADL's New York, New Jersey region, which unfortunately has seen its share of terrible and violent anti-Semitic incidents over the past over the past few weeks. So Scott, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Fred, for that powerful introduction. I will add that we mounted this because of overwhelming demand. It was the request that we received more than any other over the past few weeks. What can we do about the torrent of anti-Israel and anti-Semitic rhetoric online? And I want to start with uh, a little bit of uh, framing before we get to the advice. Uh, this is not a moment to reach uh, to to uh, to talk about the history of the conflict. Uh, there's really far too much to say about that, but we do need some context for the moment we're in. Uh, so I'll start by taking us back seven years ago to the Gaza conflict in the summer of 2014. The rhetoric, I, I, I think we we all many of us remember that summer. The rhetoric was horrific, both online and off, but the world moved on relatively quickly. And I want to ask, uh, and I'll start with Rachel, what's, what's different about this moment uh, is that the, the racial justice lens is somehow being applied to this conflict. Rachel, tell us how that manifests itself and how different this is from 2014. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, ADL. Pleasure to be here with you and Dave and um, to think and learn together. I think that you are right, Scott, to note that it's not as if this is the first time Israel has engaged in a crisis with Hamas. We have been here before, we have seen this before. And so the question you're posing of why is it different this time feels like Manish Chana Halayla Hazeh, but it is different this time. And the reason I think it is different is precisely because what we have seen happening, particularly in the American landscape, but of course it's transnational, 
is that there really has been a litmus test defining how one can show up in order to address serious societal challenges, whether it's racism, homophobia, transphobia, issues of misogyny, and in order to be part of the communities that clearly denounce and condemn forms of hatred, we are now seeing that on that list is the dissociation with Israel, an anti-Zionist position. But I wanna be very clear here. Anti-Zionism has been a response throughout the history of Jewish life. It has been along the spectrum of possibilities. So we're not talking about anti-Zionism that's a part of a way to engage in critiquing Israel in a sophisticated way. The anti-Zionism we see playing out is an anti-Semitic form, and it's around Jews holding real power. It's a form of hatred specifically for Jews having a sovereignty. So the simplistic trope or the simplistic lens that is being applied here is that Jews are perceived as white. By extension, Israelis are perceived as white, even though we know 50% of the population is Mizrahi from the Middle East or from North Africa. And so that's not taken into consideration, but Israel as a white entity, as an imperialist colonialist out outpost in the region is perceived as trying to um, harm, discriminate and persecute even people of color who are indigenous. And in this case, that means Palestinians. That is the trope that is being applied. So it is white against black. And the biggest sin for sure at this point in time is being racist. So what we are seeing is that in order to um, identify with all of these um, other marginal communities and groups, one has to clearly denounce Israel, dissociate from a Zionist position in order to be accepted as part of that progressive community. This is highly problematic for Jews in Israel. Yeah, and I think I would add polarization to the mix as well, which uh, certainly we're a much more polarized society than we were before. Absolutely. Um, uh, Dave, I want to hear your thoughts uh, more from a, a technological perspective. What's changed in terms of social media over these seven years? Yeah, thank you, Scott. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me as well, uh, and and Rachel. It's great to be here with you in honor. Um, and, and thanks everyone for, for joining us. I, I think, so there's a number of really important things to recognize. First off, just the immense proliferation of social media since, you know, since uh, 2013. And that, you know, in the last seven years, uh, you know, children have been born and grown up and have never known you know, a life without a digital device to help to nurture them and bring them up. And, you know, it's become such a, an even deeper part of the way that we communicate with each other. The second thing to recognize is that the social media companies, the centralization that has really continued to grow over the last seven years. And this is a trend that was starting, you know, well before then, but it has continued to accelerate. And the reason why this is so important is to recognize that the algorithms that are used to be able to show you what shows up in your feed first, second, third, or last, these are opaque algorithms. And that the social media companies over the last seven to 10 years have really refined the understanding of the cognitive biases that human beings have as part of our biology and the way that they then have exploited that in order to gain additional engagement, right, because of the advertising business model, that this is a way to, it enhances clickbait, it enhances polarization, it enhances and amplifies things that are, let's just say, uh, cognitive, cognitively resonant with the beliefs that you already have, and therefore allow for far less cross-cultural and cross-divide uh, communication to really occur, and instead tend to solidify or, uh, or reward the kinds of content that is inflammatory 
and gets you likes and comments and engagement on the platform. So, you know, the, this has become really a science and those social media platforms are doing this opaquely without us actually understanding what we see is not what other people see or what everyone sees. Okay, uh, clearly we've come a, a great distance since 2014 uh, and, and, uh, and not for the better, um, uh, at least uh, you know, in terms of this context. Uh, Dave, I wanna stick with you for a moment and uh, uh, ask you one other contextual question, uh, which is that we are building uh, in terms of anti-Semitism on an incredible baseline in this country. In 2014, the number of anti-Semitic assaults, harassment, and vandalism were a fraction of what they are today. Tell us a bit about the baseline we were looking at uh, just before this conflict began. Absolutely. Uh, so ADL has been tracking anti-Semitism online back since the days of 9,600 baud modems. Uh, so we've been there, we've been watching this for a long time. Let me give you just a quick highlight of some of the numbers around a nationally representative survey that we have been conducting for the past three years. The most recent one has just came out at the end of January, our online hate and harassment survey. Um, and 41% of Americans report being harassed online sometime during their lifetime. 41%, 27% report having experienced severe harassment. That's physical threats, sexual harassment, stalking and sustained harassment. And in particular, when we dug in further and looked at Jews and the Jewish population, we oversampled, we said, okay, so 33% of Jewish respondents experienced online harassment and 20% experienced severe harassment. So this is unfortunately has grown. And even when we compare it to last year, the numbers are actually very similar. So despite what you hear in the news about Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all of these organizations that say that they are working hard to eliminate hate and harassment from their platforms, while they are in many cases doing this work, the actual perceived experience that people have. It's just not enough. We are still seeing a lot of hate and harassment. And of course, we can talk about just over the last two weeks, the significant rise that we've seen in anti-Semitism online as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, ADL is at the center of this. Uh, we, we've seen such an incredible uptick. Uh, Rachel, I wanna get right to uh, the practical. Uh, now that we frame this, um, the question, the first question I have for you is, should we be responding to the anti-Semitism that we see on social media? And if so, what advice do you have to offer to people? It's a very good question, Scott. I think it depends um, what the intent is in the response. And I think it depends with whom you intend to engage. So I would say if you actually have a relationship with someone it's someone that you actually know in real life and is your friend, there is a way to engage that allows for an opening of a conversation. Usually posing questions is a way to do that. So for example, if a friend uses the hashtag free Palestine, if you felt comfortable, whether it's in the comments, a DM, a direct message, or you know, in a chat form, to be able to say to that friend, I saw that you used the hashtag free Palestine and I'm interested in understanding what that means to you because for me, it has a very different connotation. Would you be open to having a conversation in real life so that you can um, share your perspective and I can share my perspective and then see where that will take you. If you don't have that relationship though, one has to really ask, why would you want to engage? Is it to qualify information that they presented to address misinformation? Is it an attempt to post something so that the 80% of people who are in the middle or don't know anything about this may pause and reflect on what you say? Perhaps. If it's someone you don't know, I do not think it is worth engaging online in any shape or form. That's my own position on this. And if it's an influencer or some kind of, you know, celebrity, 
They don't care who you are. They're not interested in your comment. They are not going to respond to you. So it really doesn't necessarily do anything in, in a significant way. And then the other piece I will say, if it's a hardcore detractor, I'm not sure that it has any, um, there's any reason to do it because it will take you down a very problematic rabbit hole. What I will say is that I really truly believe only by going off social can you actually have meaningful, substantial engagement because just throwing a tit for tat, you know, supposed facts at both of one another, it's not going to actually result in moving the needle in any significant way. The other thing I would just say very quickly is so many of us tend to just keep doing this all day. And I have to say that all of the individuals watching right now, everyone has really solid critical thinking skills. So don't just shelve those when you're scrolling. Actually consider who is writing this, for what purpose, what facts do they include, what facts don't they include, what narrative is being constructed, is there a call to action? And only by actually engaging in those questions do you get a better sense of whether or not you should respond, not respond, or how to respond. Okay. Um, Dave, uh, responding to anti-Semitism online is not just a matter of the substantive response. Uh, there are also technological tools. So from your vantage point, what should people, uh, or what, what should the people listening uh, today do if they see anti-Semitism online or if they're harassed online, as you said, uh, and how can ADL help? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so let's just talk about uh, a, a variety of different levels of interaction that you can have. So certainly as to Rachel's point, right, we, have, we, we like to say there's this term like don't feed the trolls. Um, what that means is, you know, so if someone is engaging in obviously inflammatory rhetoric, if someone is clearly taking a position or a side and they're saying things that, you know, are just trying to get people riled up, you know, you're, you're feeding right into what they want when you respond. However, what you can do is you can report to the actual platform. So on every single major platform, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or uh, TikTok, you, you name it, there's going to be three little dots. Often it's in the upper right-hand corner. Sometimes it's in the left-hand corner. It, it, you'll see it if you're on the web, it'll see it at the top right of each post. And what you do is you tap or click on those three little dots and there will be an interface there that allows you to report that particular post or that particular user or that particular video. And what this does is, number one, it alerts the platform that there's a problem um, and that they're seeing this. this. This will often cause it to get moderated or looked at by an actual uh, human being in a content moderation queue. But that's not where you stop because very often these platforms have automated systems that are actually tracking a lot of these things. So if you see it, it may already have gone through a certain level of automated review uh, and have passed. Or you may actually get a result back from the platform saying, thank you very much, but we find that this didn't actually violate our policies. So what's actually the next important step is to take that report that you just got, right? Because there'll usually be a ticket number that's associated with it. Take a screenshot of that if you're on your phone or copy it down if you're looking at this on the web. And then you go to adl.org slash report incident. And by the way, you don't even need to go there. You can just go to adl.org and within five seconds, you'll see a, a pop-up will show up right now that will allow you to quickly go to that form and to report the incident to us. Now, why is this important? Um, because at ADL, at, especially at CTS, we are literally in conversations with the top trust and safety, content moderation and policy teams at all of these major platforms. And this allows us to be able to, if necessary, escalate the areas of review. It also allows us to communicate with them and to continue to push them forward to be doing the right thing. Now, obviously, we're often going to have disagreements, right? That we, something that you, know, you or I might think is violative of their policy may not be. But when you report it, 
It helps it to get tracked and it helps us to take those reports on mass higher up the chain, sort of a, 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 the, the, the place to call, so to speak. I, I think many people don't realize that uh, ADL plays that role in the community uh, and will really help in terms of, of the technology. It's, it's really your work at, at CTS. Now, I will, I will say a couple of other things that I neglected to mention. If someone is making a personal threat, if you feel like you are in danger, forget everything I just said, call 911, right? You need to talk to law enforcement. Like that's, you know, and the FBI has a cyber crimes division, you know, the, all of the major metropolitan areas, you know, have people who are dedicated to cyber crime. You know, if you feel like you're, you know, you're being threatened or someone posts, for example, information about your home address or your work address or where your kids go to school. I, I hate to put it this way, but it does happen. It's called doxing. Um, you know, then there are other measures to take. But if we're just talking about reporting, hey, I saw something anti-Semitic or, you know, they're posting this cartoon or, you know, there's someone who's talking about Jews in a certain way and not specific to me, then I would certainly recommend you report first, keep track of the, of the report number, and then let ADL know and we will continue to escalate as well. Yeah, and certainly if uh, there's a need for law enforcement and you're concerned or you don't know who to reach out to, again, if you put it in uh, adl.org forward slash report incident, uh, somebody will reach out to you and will, uh, will assist you in that. Um, uh, Rach, I want to ask because uh, we, we did, uh, when we sent out uh, the notice about this event, we asked people for questions. And I think perhaps the most common question that we got was resources. Um, what what resources can people use to, to understand the, the conflict better uh, or to be able to respond to issues related to the conflict or related to the anti-Semitism that they're seeing online? Uh, what, what, uh, what do you recommend? Well, as you can tell from my background, I actually believe in something that's now often countercultural, which is reading. So I'm going to say you're going to have to invest some serious time in reading. You don't have to read all the books, but you do have to read some of the books. And most of the things that you need to read are not going to actually label how much time it takes to read, like we see in our social media feeds when it's an article and it says a five minute read. So what I'm going to suggest is that you pick up some books, um, whether it's Yossi Klein Halevi's books, Letters to a Palestinian Neighbor, whether, whether it's Daniel Gordis's book, looking at Israel as a history, um, reading Deborah Lipstadt's books on anti-Semitism and Barry Weiss on anti-Semitism. I mean, these are sort of foundational texts that one needs to spend some time with. And is, they are all very accessible. They can be read by teenagers through adulthood. So I do, I do actually think in order to engage in understanding these issues, one has to be able to be a T, have depth and breadth. You don't have to have all the answers, but if you are only um, scrambling for the next talking point, it's very problematic because all it takes is a little bit of push and you're going to find that you're not prepared to engage in any kind of serious conversation. I do also think that utilizing questions and asking questions opens up conversations, allows at times, either to expose the hypocrisy, to open up the conversation, to actually call someone in, and other times actually show the absurdity in the thinking that is being put forth. So again, depending upon your intention, you have to be able to know how to do that. Um, and, and that takes practice, and that requires some active listening skills. It requires some ability to have content and to be able to put that in, in a historical context, and then to practice, which will require and give more confidence. You know, I want to move on to, uh, to audience questions because there's so many coming in. But before I do that, uh, Rachel, I just want to ask you to, to pull out your, your crystal ball. Uh, and uh, tell us where do we go from here in terms of the conflict? Um, you know, I, I think part of this is a discussion of the issue of Israeli Arabs. Part of it is an issue of the peace process, but just a, a little bit, because I think, again, it's going to be important for context. Sure. So listen, I mean, Scott, in all seriousness, I was trained as a historian precisely so that I don't have to predict the future. I get to look back on the past. Um, but what we do see 
for real in, in Israel right now is that um, we're in a situation in which Hamas ideologically is doing something that is quite dangerous as it is trying to cultivate and sow the seeds of hate to suggest that coexistence is not possible between Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs, both of whom are citizens of the state. That issue in particular is a reopening of the 1948 files. And it poses a serious challenge to the tapestry and to the civic identity of Israeliness and what it means to be an Israeli that is Jewish and non-Jewish. And Hamas is purposefully engaged in trying to exacerbate those particular tensions. We have a moment in time in which a people is confronting a conflict with its state. We also know that Hamas purposefully wants to be able to claim success over Fatah. Remember, Fatah was about to have elections. They have not had elections in 15 years. The leadership of Fatah is deemed to be pretty weak, pretty impotent at this point in time. That leadership is really called into question, particularly in the West Bank. We know that from some of the research policy work that Khalil Shakaki has done, former professor at Brandeis University, for the Palestinian Research Center at Bir Zayit University, that the younger you go with Palestinians who live in the West Bank, the more likely at this point in time, they would vote for Hamas rather than for Fatah. Now this poses a very serious challenge and it's not because these individuals identify with radical Islamist perspectives necessarily in terms of their religious identity, but it's really to show that they do not think that Fatah can do the job. And Israel is very concerned about having itself sandwiched between two entities controlled by Hamas. The other piece here is that much of what we see playing out with Hamas is really a proxy for a larger regional conflict with Iran, whether it's Hezbollah who later gets involved and then Iran, uh, that's to be seen. But we know this is not just about the Palestinians. Now, something that's quite different than 2014, Scott, is that the geopolitical relationship with some of the surrounding Arab countries has changed, meaning the UAE, Bahrain from the Arab Abrahamic Accords, that is quite different. And even during the escalation in tensions, those countries were very clear. They did not denounce Israel. They did call for a ceasefire. They are holding tight to the relationship with Israel which is a very different reality geopolitically than we had in 2014. And they may play an important role. We don't yet know, but it is possible beyond the ceasefire to see when these two you know, or three parts of leadership, Israeli, Hamas, and Palestinian in the West Bank, might be able to come together. I do think the biggest piece that we need to be paying attention to is actually not about the Palestinians, though, in uh, the West Bank or Hamas, but really to understand what is happening with the Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. Because the work that has been done and created for coexistence in serious and significant ways, we cannot allow that to be torn apart by outside influences. I think it's little known that uh, this is the work of ADL in, uh, in Israel. Uh, ADL's work, like, we, like I do as New York, New Jersey director here in, uh, in, uh, in this region, um, is about fighting hate and discrimination in Israeli society. So our director, Carol Noriel, uh, has spent decades trying to build a more cohesive society in Israel. And I think uh, really important to know that... Um, uh, that this work is uh, is something that she's very passionate about. Uh, I actually interviewed her recently, and I'm I'm going to to release that interview very soon. Uh, and I think uh, her her remarks uh, not only about the work that she does building a more cohesive society, but her remarks about uh, her hope for the future uh, were were really very very inspiring. Uh, so I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, so let's let's move to questions. And Dave, there's there's a lot of kind of technical questions coming in for you. One of which is um, 
more and more I run into triple dots that do not respond to a click. It looks like somebody has purposefully disabled uh, that ability. And is there a way to override that? Uh, so I, I'm not sure. Do you know about that? <laughs> That seems a little unusual. I, I mean, maybe we, if there's a, an individual who's having a particular issue uh, with that, we can take that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I mean, I would suggest, you know, you can restart the app, you can restart your browser just to make sure that, um, because these are generally platform specific reporting capabilities individual users don't actually have the ability to turn that off. So, uh, you know, if that's a, if that's a situation, uh, you know, give us a, give us a call or, you know, give us a write in to, to the ADL uh, report incident and, and our team will certainly be, be available to help walk you through that. Okay, great. Uh, there's another question um, a bit broader. We are so outnumbered on social media. How can we begin to make an impact? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's it's actually one of the reasons why we tend to focus on having uh, long, deep relationships with the technology companies themselves. Um, so uh, I can tell you that uh, my team we meet with uh, the you know top trust and safety and policy folks from uh, the major technology companies on at least a monthly basis. In fact, I was just uh, on a call. With uh, with some of the top with the literally the the top trust and safety folks uh, over at TikTok this afternoon, um, and and I can tell you they take this very very seriously. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of you know work that we do together to push content moderation standards and help them also their moderators who are literally tens of thousands of human beings to actually understand what does it actually mean anti-Semitism and how is that distinguished, for example, where it's hate or harassment against a protected group or protected class, right? Like being Jewish or, you know, or is this actually, you know, a, a, um, a constructive engagement or perhaps an angry engagement about something that the government of Israel is doing, right? And recognizing that those often are two very different policies. So helping them to understand those things. As individuals, there are a number of actually proven techniques that can help. So one of them is actually based off of a group in Europe that was fighting neo-Nazis. And let me give you what they did. And this has actually been very, very helpful. So what they found was that there were a lot of anti-immigrant and fascist kind of uh, statements that were being made on a number of newspaper websites. And you know, when one person would go in and try to fight in the comment section, they very easily get overwhelmed. But what they did was they actually got 20 of their friends and they all went in targeted to that particular article comment section. And everyone, rather than, again, feeding the trolls, they just educated. They just talked about here's what's going on. Here are the benefits. Here's what's actually happening. And what they found very quickly was that this was a way to completely extinguish the heat from this conversation. And so what I would suggest, right, is that if you are motivated to this, find some of your friends. And rather than just try to go willy nilly at helping to correct the internet, what you do is you focus yourself on certain particular areas or topics or websites or comment sections. And then you can go in together to actually work on trying to change the tone of the conversation. But it's not just David and Rachel who are there, but there's like 20 or 30 people who are there. Um, obviously, you know, this isn't easy. It takes work. But I think what we all need to understand and what we all remember is that, you know, genocides and, uh, and hate and harassment, these things don't come out of nowhere. And it's people's inaction, right, that helps to lead others down that path. So we need to stand together, we need to stand up, and we need to be educating and commenting on a regular basis to be able to make that voice heard. And don't feed the trolls. Focus yourself on areas where you can actually provide some positive education and a conversation. Can I just add something to that, Scott? I think, Dave, you're spot on. I really agree with you. I will also say that it's important for everyone to remember that 
this conflict and the way it's being talked about right now didn't happen just two weeks ago. The framing for this has happened over the last 30 years. It started in the academies and slowly over time chipped away to enter mainstream discourse, enter the social justice movements, enter community relations, enter the political you know, lanes and enter the media. It took about 30 years in order for it to slowly erode those guardrails that had been placed we have seen this in the past. We saw this in the 1970s when the UN resolution said that Zionism is racism. We saw Europe clearly saying on signs everywhere to decolonize. We saw the signs that once said Jews get out of Europe and now they say Jews get out of Palestine, right? Or Jews go to Palestine, now Jews get out of Palestine. So this is not new in any shape or form. But what has changed dramatically is that because, as you talked about, Dave, that cognitive bias, the algorithms, we are now so deeply entrenched only in our own echo chambers, it is very hard to break out of the identity politics. It is very hard to hear and have conversations that can be civil, that can be meaningful, that can be substantive, that don't only rely on the lightning rod of emotion. And that has changed the framework. And we're not going to reclaim this overnight. It's actually going to have to be a long-term sustained effort over time. And it's not going to be slogans that win, win that in any shape or form at the end of the day. It's going to be one-to-one relationship building, behind the scenes conversations, engaging with people in real time, Because no slogan, you want to say, they say free Palestine, you want to say free Palestinians from Hamas, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The majority of people who are engaged in this right now are don't knows. They're doing this because it's performative allyship. They are doing this because they perceive Israel to be the Goliath and the Palestinians are the David. The trope has completely reversed itself. So, Do not anticipate at all that we're going to have any meaningful ability to change this tomorrow, but we have a responsibility to start today. So I'm getting several questions about celebrities and celebrities who post all kinds of anti-Semitic or or anti-Israel statements. And it sounds like from what you're saying, uh, it's it's not even somebody that we should engage with. But do you have any advice in terms of of, uh, what people should do when they see this? Uh, it's, I mean, it's a hard one. Uh, look, certainly uh, report it and report the incident. I mean, if there is some one thing I've learned about celebrities, they tend to be extremely sensitive to public opinion. So, you know, if they notice that a public that the public opinion is shifting, uh, you can often see an apology or a change in stance or a or a modification of their views and so on and so forth. But but that doesn't generally happen in the comments of their Instagram feeds. Are they notified when somebody is, is uh, filing a report against them? It depends on the platform. Uh, certainly, there, none, of the pal- none of the platforms notify, you know, notify Rachel, David Siffrey, you know, reported something against you. There's nothing along those lines. Um, you know, the, the uh, you do need to understand if we're talking about celebrities in particular, um, they have teams of people who actually manage their social media feeds. They are not doing it themselves. At best, maybe they're taking the photographs, although they even have photographers who would do that too. So, you know, recognize that there is a completely different sub industry around social media for celebrities and other types of public figures that are different than, you know, the kinds of things that you or I do. Um, So no, they're probably not going to read that incredibly lucid comment that you wrote to, you know, dissuade them of the opinion that they said they're on to the next thing. Their social media teams, however, are probably looking at the overall sentiment of their comments, right? They're looking and seeing, gee, how many times did we get retweeted versus commented versus liked, right? These are, you know, these are the kinds of questions that will often come up. But um, yeah, it's, they're they're really not reading what you're saying. Rachel, do you have anything to add? 
I mean, I feel very strongly like they, they are definitely not paying attention to what Rachel Fish thinks of them. Also, you have to remember some of these individuals who are influencers like the Bella Hadid, she has Palestinian heritage. It shouldn't surprise any of us that that's where she's going to fall on the spectrum. The rest, again, majority, it's performative allyship. And the majority of these individuals are don't knows and just trying to fall in line with what is deemed to be progressive. So it, it really is a sub industry and they're not interested in what you're going to write. It's not going to have a long term impact. Do it if you want to do it. But don't think for a moment that that kind of what I call slacktivism is actually going to create meaningful change. But, but what will change is when you talk to your kids and when you talk to your friends. And when you talk to the people that you are in close personal relationships with, and these are often uncomfortable conversations to have, but that's where real impact and real exchange of ideas and views and real education occurs. So, you know, this, this talk was, was specifically geared for high school and college students. Uh, and I know that uh, high school and college students are dealing with difficult conversations with their friends and perhaps with their professors or their teachers. Um, Rachel, any particular advice when dealing with difficult situations in a school setting? Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing a lot of questions around that. Obviously, it depends if you're in a high school, a middle school versus a university. Um, listen, you need to find the grownups in the institution. The grownups really matter, whether it's administrators, um, whether it's certain faculty members that a student trusts, but you need to be able to have open, transparent conversations. And again, you have to have some, some intention of charitability. Don't assume that everyone is actually an anti-Semite. There may be some, I'm not discrediting that reality, but a lot of the, a lot of what's happening on campus is coming from that don't know audience. And also university administrators are don't knows. They don't understand how anti-Semitism has transformed over time from hatred of Jews because of their religion, hatred of Jews as a racial identity, now hatred of Jews because of their state. And very often the discussions around anti-Israel sentiment and that line of anti-Semitism is not understood by many individuals, even the grownups. So there has to be real education on that front for the administrators. And there are some organizations who are doing that work. Not enough work has been done in that area, but some is taking place. So you do need to report it to the actual grownup. You need to tell your parents. If it's something that happened in the classroom with a professor, with a teacher, if it's something that happened with a peer, that has to also be shared because, again, context truly matters. Um, and then the question is, is the offense serious in terms of anti-Semitism? Is it a situation in which the Israel conversation wasn't necessarily anti-Semitic, but it made someone feel uncomfortable? And that all has to be unpacked. We can't also be afraid of ideas. Again, not everyone is going to end up in the same policy position or advocacy position, but if there can be civility, if there is respect, if there can be an exchange of ideas in a meaningful and productive way, even if you are sitting with some discomfort in that conversation, that is okay. That is called leaning in and having some productive discomfort for the purpose of growing. You don't have to like and end up in the same position as the person but that has to be differentiated. But when real anti-Semitism happens, and it may happen, you have to be able to report it so that it can be addressed internally within the, within the institution. If the, if the school or the university doesn't do anything, it needs to go to ADL, it needs to go to Hillel, it needs to go to Chabad, it needs to go to the, climate, um, the Center for Campus Climate at Hillel. Those are real institutions that are tracking these things, trying to address them, at the systemic level, the structural level of the institution. I, I think some of our uh, students are, frankly, all of us don't understand uh, when it, it does reach the level of anti-Semitism. Um, free Palestine is a phrase that's thrown around. From the river to the sea is a phrase that's thrown around. Uh, all kinds of references to Zionism uh, and really not knowing what Zionism is. Can, can you maybe unpack a little bit of, uh, about when it really is anti-Semitic? 
Yeah, so I, I tend to use Scott Natan Sharansky, former Soviet refusenik, his 3D test as just sort of the sniff test to determine if something is anti-Semitic. So his three Ds are demonization, delegitimization, and a double standard. So when Israel is demonized, right, when Israel is said to be the new Nazi, anti-Semitic, when it's dehumanized and you have sort of anti-Semitic tropes that are laid on top of Israel controlling the world media, anti-Semitic. When you see Israel delegitimized, meaning does Israel have a right to exist? And the answer is no, anti-Semitism. None of that leads to constructive engagement about Israel, Israeli society. It's not about should there be two states? Should you have one state? Should there be the green line in this location or in a different location? What happens with this type of government or a different type of government? That's nuanced, constructive discussion. That happens throughout Israel in every part of Israeli society. And that happens in the American Jewish community. So we have to understand where that line is. I will tell you, you see it on social all the time. Dave, you've probably seen it nonstop. I have. And we see it all the time in the university where the starting point is, does Israel have a right to exist? Now, no other nation state, does anyone say, huh, does Mexico have a right to exist? Right? Does America have the right to exist knowing its problematic history? So that's when you can use questions to sort of highlight the hypocrisy. Uh, Dave, we are, um, we're getting several questions which uh, are of a more technical nature, but maybe you can kind of uh, offer a, a broad sense of it. And that's around section 230. Uh, so, um, uh, well, maybe define what section 230 is and, and what, um, what your recommendation is regarding that. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a terrific question. And boy, the, do we have, so we've got what, six hours left? Is that right, Scott? Um, because, because I know we could spend I quite a bit of time. That way. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I'm going to first just state, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. I do though have, uh, you know, have some expertise here. Section 230, uh, as we're, to, uh, we're talking about is a very important and some would even say foundational element to, um, to how the internet has worked over the last 20 or so years. It comes actually from the particular section in a, in a law that used to be called the Communications Decency Act. It's, it's now just the Communications Act. Um, it, it, and, and essentially what it does is it helps to set some clear boundaries around what kind of speech and how much protection uh, internet companies and internet service providers, and you know, it has expanded into social media companies and the like, um, around how much or how little moderation they are required to do or need to do around user-generated content, like the things that we're talking about. And what it, what it has tended to do is it really gave a very, very broad brush um, of uh, immunity to these social media providers and websites and ISPs, especially early on. This was you know, the late, 19, 19, late 1990s when this was passed, um, to allow them actually to be able to bring content moderation in without fear of being sued, but also that uh, they could also choose to not do very much content moderation without fear of being sued. Um, in many ways, this has been deemed problematic uh, and ADL certainly feels like there needs to be reform here in Section 230 because what it has done is it's essentially allowed a tremendously powerful shield from any kind of deeper inquiry or you know, legal process into how the social media companies themselves and other tech companies work and how they tend to either bias or uh, how they moderate content. So, you know, we actually have a plan uh, called Repair and you can go to ADL.org and you can take a look at the Repair Plan that actually looks at a comprehensive whole of society approach, which also includes some regulatory changes around things like Section 230 as a part of how to reform 
the entire uh, the internet ecosystem to make sure that we are accounting and taking um, uh, giving credence to the targets and victims of hate and harassment, uh, and and being um, uh, moving the balance uh, away from purely a free speech discussion, because we already have the First Amendment. The First Amendment here in the United States still applies. Um, what we're talking about, though, is what are some reasonable changes to Section 230 to ensure that there is some checks and balances against some of the egregious um, manipulations and the egregious um, uh, ish problems that social media companies have so far been able to use 230 as a shield against. Anyway, lots to discuss, but probably not for the re, you know the remainder of our time. We could easily talk about this for hours. Okay, um, we are coming to the end. Um, I, I'm going to give you both uh, a, a minute to kind of wrap things up. If there's any additional points that you want to make, maybe let's start with you, Rachel. Listen, I think that um, I'm going to say two things, and they're not directly about. Um, Israel or social media. One is I think we really need to dig into our reserves of res resiliency. We are a resilient people. Jews have always been able to overcome massive moments of strife. We need to be able to find within those reserves, the resiliency to empower each other within our communities to have strong sense of Jewish pride and humility to feel like we need to know more, to be willing to engage in order to build bridges, but also to understand that we have a right to exist and that we remain a vulnerable community. We are not part of the white majority. We need to be protected. We need serious relationships with all different types of communities to have meaningful allies, but we also have to be able to say, that we have the gang, right, that we need in order to be able to do this. That's not easy to do. It actually means swimming up tide. It means doing things that are quite unpopular, especially for teens who have a lot of peer pressure, social pressures that maybe we as grownups don't feel to the same extent. And I just want each of the teens who are listening to know you're not alone. Like if you're feeling serious stress about this, then talk to your parents, reach out to people in your community, form your kind of gang so that you have a brain trust, a support system in place. Email, text me, I'm happy to help you. Like you're not alone in this and you're not expected to do this on your own, but I do wanna empower you to stand tall and also to be willing to grow and learn and utilize and build your muscle of compassion. So that's one. The second thing I wanna say is that everyone has a fear of missing out, right? FOMO. And for some of you, the thought of not being on social and what you might be missing out on feels really overwhelming and scary. And I wanna tell you that if this becomes too much on social and for your own mental health and emotional kind of health, you need to get off social. You need to get in relationships in real life, go on walks, enjoy conversations, put yourself out in the real world so that you can actually engage in meaningful and substantial ways because just living on these devices, it's rewiring our brains in highly problematic ways. This isn't real. So find your people, spend time with them and actually, you know, see, pick up a book and, um, and see what you can do in a serious way as a community so that you feel a deep sense of belonging. Know that you are rooted in your Jewish identity and yet you belong to a people that really is trying to have an impact on a much larger society. Dave? Yeah, wow. Uh, tough to follow Rachel's incredibly eloquent uh, conclusion. Uh, let me say this. Uh, so in addition to, of course, you're not alone and we are here. You know, we at ADL, we at the Center for Technology and Society, we do a bunch of the heavy lifting because 
that's our jobs. It's hard to do. You you need to, you know, be able to do this day in and day out and, you know, make sure that we're working to, to fight for your interests and to ensure that people are treated fairly, that anti-Semitism is rooted out, that, um, that, that people who are being harassed um, are getting the help that they need, that if you are a target or a victim of harassment or hate online, please reach out to us and we're here to help. And that each one of us that even though it may feel like we're small and it feels like we're powerless and it feels like we're helpless in the moment, we are not, we're not small, we're not powerless and we are not helpless. And that especially as we band together and as we work together, you know, when you see something happening, be an upstander, right? Don't just be a bystander. If you see that someone else is being harassed, if you see that there's, you know, hate that is going on around you, if you see someone being bullied, it is uncomfortable, it is hard, it feels unsafe, but it is so critical. And we as Jews, like this is something that is so important and critical for us as a people, but also for us to be continuing to do for others as well. Because as we stand up and as we say no, society starts to change. And have courage, have courage, and know that we are with you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'm going to close out today's discussion. You are all our ambassadors. Uh, and now that you've heard all of this, we need you to, to act on it. Uh, we need you to encourage others and inspire others to act on it. Uh, I'm so grateful to our two extraordinary experts, Dr. Rachel Fish and my colleague, Dave Sifri, for joining us here today for this timely and critical discussion. I'm sure that I speak for all and I say how empowering, uh, certainly the last few minutes, but, but all of it uh, was, uh, how empowering it is for all of us to come together and figure out constructive ways to approach this. Thank you both so much. Uh, and thanks to all of you for attending uh, and for all you do to fight anti-Semitism. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.